It's an emergency. Please, quick. What's wrong? Yeah, I can hear someone dying. I'm not sure. Why do you think someone's dying? I, I'm not sure, but maybe someone killed, killed my, my, um, my brother's family. The body I on July 18, 2019, Kathy Xie went to visit her brother Norman and his wife Lily Lin at work in North Epping in the northwestern suburbs of Sydney. She was surprised to find the family-operated newspaper agency closed. Concerned, she grabbed her husband Robert, and together they walked over to the Lin home, located just a few blocks away. When the couple arrived they found the front door unlocked and the walls covered in blood splatter. What happened to the Lin family? The unanswered question hung in the air like a thick fog, leaving them yearning for answers and desperate to unravel the enigmatic puzzle of the Lin family's fate. Welcome to Insight Wave, the channel that delves into both solved and unsolved cases from around the world. If you haven't already, please take a moment to like and subscribe to stay up to date with the latest crime stories delivered straight to your inbox. Min Lin and Yun Lily Lin migrated from China to Australia, where they met and fell in love. It was a classic story of immigrants working tirelessly in hopes of providing a better future for their children. In North Epping, they grew their news agency business into a big success, amassing an impressive estimated annual revenue of $1 million. The Lins became cherished figures within their community, adored by many. Bound by strong family ties, the Lins created a close-knit household. Lily's sister, Irene, also lived in the same house and actively assisted in caring for her nephews and niece. The family was comprised of the eldest sibling, 15-year-old Brenda, followed by 12-year-old Henry and 9-year-old Terry. Min Lin's sister, Kathy, and her husband, Robert Xie, lived within walking distance of Min Lin's house. They moved to Melbourne in 2002, where Robert, formerly an ear, nose, and throat specialist in China, embarked on a brand new career path. He opened up a restaurant, but after a couple of years, he had to close it down. Three years later, they relocated to Sydney to be closer to their beloved family members, Min Lin and Lily. Kathy worked part-time in Min Lin's news agency business. It was a Saturday morning on July 18, 2009. On one of the busiest days, Min Lin's news agency was closed without any notice. That was rather unusual as the news agency had been operating daily. His customers were close to him, finding him as a daily fixture in their daily routine. Even though English was not Min Lin's first language, he found ways to connect with his consumers. He was always friendly and willing to help. On that morning that the shop was not open, a worried customer called up Min Lin's sister, Kathy, to inquire. At around 9 a.m. Kathy and Robert went to the Lin's house and when they arrived they found the front door unlocked and the walls covered in blood splatter. Emergency. Please, quick. What's wrong? Yeah, I think someone's dying. I'm not sure. Why do you think someone's dying? I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe someone killed, killed my, my, um, my brother's family. The body, I know, I just have to call you. I need someone to come quick. You yeah, know. we are coming. Like, someone killed my brother's family. About, can you see their body? Yeah, I saw. When officers arrived at the Lynn home, they found the bludgeoned bodies of Norman, Lily, their two sons, 12 year old Henry and 9 year old Terry and Lily's sister, Irene. In addition to being struck with a hammer, four of the victims had also been strangled. Twenty-four bloody footprints were found throughout the home, all of which were the same size, leading investigators to believe the killer had acted alone. There was only one survivor of the Lynn family, Norman and Lily's daughter, 15-year-old Brenda Lynn. Brenda was away on a school trip at the time of the murders and her room was the only one that hadn't been entered. Brenda was on a year 10 French school trip in New Caledonia with Cheltenham Girls High School at the time, and learned of the murders via Facebook. She immediately returned home hoping that there was some sort of mix-up. 
It wasn't until she saw Aunt Kathy's grief-stricken face, that she knew it was all true. When the news broke, the media reported the possibility that the incident was a murder-suicide. Acting Superintendent Stephen Heckel spoke to the press at the scene and confirmed the possibility of a murder-suicide, stating that it was under investigation. Police determined that the murders occurred between 2 a.m. and 5.30 a.m. The electricity to the Lynn house had been cut, and it appeared likely that if someone had entered from the outside, a key was used to gain access, as there was no sign of forced entry. Upon examination of the house, no obvious signs of theft were found. A makeshift hammer-like weapon was identified as the murder weapon, but it had not been located. None of the injuries were deemed to be self-inflicted. This was definitely not a murder-suicide. The severity of the injuries initially led the police to believe that a gun had been used. However, post-mortem examination revealed otherwise. In addition to blunt force trauma, asphyxia was identified as a contributing cause of death in four out of the five victims. The likely scenario was that the parents were killed first, possibly suffocated to subdue them before being beaten. The level of brutality inflicted on both men and Lily showed that they had received the most violent and brutal attacks among all the victims. Similar wounds were found inflicted on Lily's sister Irene as well. The killer then likely proceeded to Henry's and Terry's bedroom, where it is believed that at least one of the boys was already awake, likely awakened by what was happening in the neighboring bedrooms. It was evident from the blood spatter patterns that there had been a furious struggle, the boys had fought with their killer. Additionally, blood was found on all of the bedroom door handles, except for Brenda's. Her door and room had not been touched. It was almost as if the killer knew she was not going to be there that night. The smears also indicated that the killer most likely wore gloves. A total of 24 bloody shoe impressions were found, and they were estimated to be from men's shoes with a size ranging between 8.5 and 10.5 in U.S. sizing. For days after the murders, Robert and Kathy were interviewed by the police. During Robert's interview, he sat with his interpreter, sipping water from a disposable cup. Two detectives asked him questions and took notes. About 35 minutes into the interview, Robert sat with his hands clenched at the table, his head down, and he began to slowly wring his hands. He struggled to explain what he had witnessed. Although he could manage in broken English, he often switched to his native Cantonese, in which he could speak fluently. His responses were brief and sometimes confused. He spoke in a quiet tone, barely lifting his eyes from the desk as he described finding the bloody remains of his family. Robert described how the night before, he had attended a family dinner, and then he and Kathy had returned home. They spent the rest of the evening watching cycling, cricket, and movies before he took a bath around 2 a.m. and then went to bed. He then recounted the horrifying scene he and Kathy had walked into the very next day. He explained that he had been telling Kathy not to look at the bodies. He rubbed his face with his hands, running his fingers over his eyes and massaging his forehead. When discussing reaching the bedroom where Henry and Teddy were, he struggled to put his words together. I, I can see everywhere it was red. Red, red, and um, everywhere. I first see it is, uh, uh, so I, I think I saw my sister-in-law first. I see it after I just look at her, I start to cry. My mother, I don't see. Once I saw her, I, I. I hold Kathy and I said, Kathy, don't don't look at it. But I believe Kathy had already seen. You know, 
Um, and I saw that um, the best side, uh, which is close to the door, mm -hmm. I saw this side. I saw a a, a, a staff, um, a group of staff. I think it was her brother. I always think that her brother was in as well because I saw her car, I saw his van, and Kathy saw his watch. I but I just feel it was so red and um, messy everywhere. No. And so we went out and uh, I went out and I went out and I went out and I went out from the room. I went out with Kathy. We ran, we ran to the other room. I saw um, the Terry's room I indicated before. It used to be Terry's room. The door was closed. Which room would be tied at that one? Irene? Okay. Yeah. Okay. The door is closed. Kathy, um, Kathy push open the door. We saw Irene on the bed. We saw Irene on the bed. Also, I saw a lot of blood. Uh, also, a lot of blood. A lot of blood around, very red. Uh, oh, I was going to touch her. I tried to touch her. I I went closer. I tried to touch her because I want to know whether she was still alive. Because I when I saw her, she was not just lying down on the bed flatly. Um, so I want to try. But um, Kathy uh, hold me back. So I think I did not actually touch touch her. Then we came out again. Uh, we reached the last bedroom. Uh, that's Henry's bedroom I indicate on the map. Uh, the, the, the door was half closed. I'm not sure. And we entered the room. And we can see uh, both children uh, were lying on the floor. Also feel very red, uh, blood all around. Messy. 
，然後我又係好想去摸下佢，睇下佢哋係咪仲活住，因為兩個細路仔。I again I wanna touch them, um, because they are just little kids. And I really wanna know whether they are still alive or not. I remember I tried to reach them by my right hand. But I can't remember. 然後應該係 Gas 拉住我走咯，我哋走啦。Kathy， 嗯、um, ，help me back and she kept 一路叫嚇，好驚咁一路大聲叫。She kept yelling, let's go, let's go. She was so frightening. Robert and Kathy became legal guardians of Brenda, and she moved into their home. They made every effort to provide her with a sense of normalcy. Brenda later referred to them as the next best thing to her family, highlighting how they cared for her, took her to school, and made her lunches. Additionally, they took over the management of the news agency, which had become a shrine to the Lin family. Locals filled the sidewalk with flowers and tributes to honor the memory of the Lin family. Despite a thorough investigation, the police at this point had no leads. On August 8th, a public funeral was held for the Lin family. Five coffins, each adorned with white flowers, were arranged in a row in front of hundreds of mourners. On top of each coffin was a framed photo of the respective family member. The profound grief was palpable among all those who attended the service. Meanwhile, the police were actively investigating whether Brenda had been spared deliberately or if she was still a potential target of a killer who may not have been aware that she was away for the week. Additionally, they were questioning whether the murders of Henry, 12, and Terry, 9, were planned or if they were carried out of necessity. Police wondered if they had woken up and seen the killer. Without knowing for sure, the police felt that it was important to maintain a close watch over Brenda to ensure her protection. Strike Force Norban commenced their murder investigation nearly a month after the gruesome events occurred. However, the investigative team quickly honed in on a particular hypothesis. They firmly believed that the perpetrator hailed from within the family circle, reasoning that the killer exhibited an intimate knowledge of the house's layout, including the whereabouts of the electricity box. It seemed plausible that they were acquainted with the location of a spare key or may have already possessed one. This theory steered their investigative endeavors. The presence of bloody shoe impressions uncovered at the crime scene strongly suggested that the murderer acted alone. As time passed, Investigators grew increasingly convinced that their scrutiny should be laser-focused on a single individual in their pursuit, Robert Sia. Robert's behavior in the months following the murders left the police puzzled, and when he was granted power of attorney over Brenda and her family's estate, it raised questions about his motives. Detectives were aware that, after the murders, Min and Kathy's parents needed emergency housing as they had been evicted from their home, a property purchased for them by Min, so it belonged to the Lin family. Robert was the one who evicted them. This raised concerns about why he would evict Brenda's grandparents, his own in-laws, from the home that Brenda's father had provided for them. One theory at the time was that by evicting them, it would limit Brenda's options, making it impossible for her to decide to live with them if they no longer had a home. The strike force faced a serious dilemma. Their top priority was Brenda's safety, and she was now in the care of their primary suspect. They conducted multiple risk assessments, which led them to believe that Robert would not harm Brenda. If Robert was indeed the killer and intended to harm Brenda, he could have done so when she returned from her trip. Her bedroom was the only one left untouched, leading the police to believe that the killer knew she was not present. Nevertheless, they had to ensure Brenda's safety. Consequently, they initiated video surveillance inside Robert's house, marking the beginning of a six-month electronic surveillance operation on Robert's year. Small pinhole cameras were strategically placed throughout his home, with assistance from the NSW Crime Commission. 
In March 2010, eight months after the murders, Robert made a call to Detective Sergeant Joseph Marie, seeking to clarify something he had previously stated. Robert claimed that he may have told a police officer at the scene that there were five bodies at the house, but what he meant was four or five. This phone call raised police suspicions about Robert Sierra. They believed that he had known from the beginning that there were five bodies, not four. When Min's body had initially not been found and was considered a potential suspect, police believed that Robert knew exactly where he was and was the one pushing Kathy to disclose the location of the body. Subsequently, they met with Robert at the Ride Police Station for another interview on March 16, 2010. In early May, investigators also interviewed Kathy once again. She denied that Robert had told her to inform the police to look under the duna for Min's body. She was adamant that she simply had a feeling that he was under there. She was informed about the 24 bloody shoe impressions, indicating a men's shoe size between US 8.5 and 10.5. They also mentioned that these shoe impressions were linked to one of three specific models of ASICS trainers. One of those models was called ASICS Gel Elevations, which had not been produced since 2005. They asked Kathy about the type of shoes Robert wore. Just days later, on May 7, 2010, investigators were reviewing video footage from inside Robert's home. The view was from above the kitchen and included part of a study area with desks and computers. Kathy was seated at one desk, watching as Robert stood at another with his back to the camera. A cutting sound could be heard repeatedly. Robert was cutting something into small pieces and placing them into a plastic bin containing liquid. Apart from the repetitive cutting sound, there was silence. Upon closer examination of the video, detectives realized that Robert was cutting up an ASICS shoe box from his men's US size 9.5 ASICS trainers. Robert picked up the bin, walked towards the kitchen, but continued on. A few seconds later, the sound of a flushing toilet could be heard. A few days later, the police conducted a five-day search of Robert and Kathy's home. They knew Robert had been up early the morning when the bodies were found, cleaning the garage. Crime scene investigators carefully examined the garage, and when they moved a chest of drawers, they discovered a stain on the floor underneath. It turned out to be a complex mixture, which was sent to America for advanced testing. The police eventually received results from the lab in the United States. The testing on the stain found in the garage was highly complex due to it being a mixed sample. If it had been a few years earlier, the sample might have been deemed too difficult to analyze, but technology had advanced. The stain was found to contain DNA from at least four of the five murder victims with Terry's DNA matching a portion of the stain with a likelihood of 50 quadrillion to one that it belonged to another person. They were also able to match the stain in the garage to a blood spot on a mattress at the scene of the crime. On May 5, 2011, nearly two years after her family was murdered, Brenda Lynn was summoned to the principal's office of her school just after 9 a.m. She was met by her principal and two detectives from the strike force. They informed Brenda that her uncle Robert had just been arrested for the murder of her family. At the same time, another detective called Kathy at the news agency with the news of Robert's arrest. Over the years, spanning four murder trials, Robert Sia has remained composed and collected. As the weeks evolved into months and then years, enduring two terminated trials, a hung jury, and a fourth trial, Sia occupied the wooden dock with an expressionless countenance. Occasionally, he made gestures towards his legal counsel, and he would nod in the direction of his wife Kathy, at times accompanied by a subtle hint of an affectionate smile. However, according to the Crown's argument, there were two facets to Sia's character, and on Thursday, a majority of eleven jurors reached a guilty verdict on five counts of murder in the NSW Supreme Court. Maintaining his impassive demeanor, Sia rose from his seat in the dock and declared, I am innocent, 
I did not murder the Lin family. His wife, with the support of a chaplain and attired neatly in a purple cardigan, wept quietly in the courtroom, her head bowed, following the verdict's pronouncement. He's innocent, she exclaimed in response to her husband's outburst. Meanwhile, Kathy's parents, Feng Ching Zhu and Yang Fei Lin, embraced Crown Prosecutor Tanya Smith and wept on the opposite side of the courtroom.